Hi, welcome to the Project Function Podcast. I'm Mike Musiolo. Joining me is Johnny Marshall Nielsen and Rodney Acero. Today we're going to be talking about why there is such a thing as optimal biomechanics, why gait training should be the centerpiece of your training, and why deadlifts build fake strength and don't respect the said principle. When something makes sense to me, I go after it pretty immediately. I've always been one of those people that really respects intellectual honesty specifically. My motivation with getting certified and, and kind of going deep with functional patterns was to fix myself. And then once I, I got into the military, I was in the Navy for a couple of years, and I started doing more of like, uh, like hiking with heavy weight. Oh Lord. Uh, maybe like 23, 24 where I was like, I don't know if I know how to work out. Like I, I just stopped doing everything completely because I saw the pattern. There's one distinct time I remember running on the beach and I, I was just telling myself, I can't feel my glutes. I was like, I don't know if I remember feeling my glutes when I ran. And I started thinking back like in high school when I, would, when I was playing sports and I would do sprints, if I would really feel my lower body working in that way. And come to think of it, it's, uh, even though I was doing all those deadlifts before and after a spinal surgery, I never really could sprint optimally. Sure. And so I didn't feel a carryover. I was like, okay, well, I'm doing all these lifts that everyone, all these other athletes are doing. Mm -hmm. But why are there people that excel at running? Why are there athletes that are running faster than others? We're all doing right. the same lifts. Right. So it's, oh, it's just genetic lottery? Okay. There right. was one time yeah. I was in, the, in this marine training that they send us to, and there's this obstacle course that we have to run. And I remember the first obstacle is like a, maybe like a ledge, like this big, like a wooden, or a wooden log that you have to hop over. And I just remember this one guy that I used to run with and running long distances I was okay at, but then the moment that we had to go on this obstacle course and the guy next to me, he just hopped on the log, like nothing, and then kept going. And I remember like, like I can't do that. Yeah. Like I went, I looked at it and I had to use my hands and then try to like climb over mm -hmm. it because I could not just like, like single leg, like he single leg, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a, like a bounding motion. Yeah. Almost. Like a bounding. Yeah. Sure. Like, like a long, like jump, mm -hmm. like single leg jump. Totally. And then that was one, one thing that stuck with me. I was like, why can't he do that? Totally. And I can't. I think <laughs> it's important also to note that we were all in our twenties, right? So 21. we should be yep. in our prime. Early 20s. Yep. We should be crushing it. We should be having no pain. We should be zero pain. Right. I remember when my dad was in his 30s and he was a monster, right? And I'm here in my 20s having like lower back problems. And I'm like, wait, why is that? And then also, I also want to note um, the level of commitment people have to these lifts. Johnny and myself and Rodney are talking about how we were lifting. We fucked ourselves up and then we went back to lifting. Multiple so, times. Multiple yep. times. So let it be known that it is usually the people who have the, the strongest commitment to their health and fitness and they're the most motivated to get into great shape that end up faring the worst. We have people who have intense exercise anxiety that come in and they're, they're, I feel bad because the person who's kind of like in their late 20s and kind of just not really taking their health very seriously is faring much better than the woman who is in her early 30s and decides to get in shape and all of a sudden decides to train for a marathon and do yoga and get up early and put herself under a whole bunch of stress. And I mean, usually 100%. within three months, I'm not even, not exaggerating at all. Within three months, they have some sort of lower back problem, hip problem, you know, shoulder problem, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, generally the people that don't work out too much, they'll maybe gain some weight. They fare better. And then, yeah, they'll just have a little bit of excess body fat and right. then they just don't know how to work out. And that's right. kind of- and the, they're like, I'm good. Yeah. And we attract those people too, actually. It's funny because I have a buddy who didn't really buy into workout culture growing up and he just bought into FP later. And I'm like, you made the right move in a way. I mean, yeah, I got into it, so he got into it. So I was kind of the guinea pig, but still, he didn't get into working out until it made sense to him. And a lot of people actually intuitively actually come to that conclusion. And it, it's really interesting how that can be. Yeah, one more thing on that. When I was going to school for exercise science, it was something that I kind of picked because I didn't know what else to, to do as I, uh, as I graduated high school. 
And I remember distinctly being in, in school and seeing some people wanted to do like physical therapy, chiropractor, some people wanted to be personal trainers. And I'm like, I don't really want to be a personal trainer. Like I, I would see what personal trainers were doing. Like, okay, you're counting reps. Uh, yeah, you're telling people to load more weight onto an exercise. Right, right. But it just doesn't seem like it's something that I, that, that I was attracted to. Sure. And then eventually I went more like, uh, like the martial arts route and, uh, and then eventually ended up coming back because of FP. Like with FP, right. it's, it's very different. But, very, very different. But yeah, I, I wasn't attracted to that culture much. I mean, I got into it when I was working out because I thought it was going to make me perform better. Yep. But uh, other than that, it's, it's, you can't blame those who, <laughs> who are put off by the gym culture. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So but like you, Rodney, I was in school for exercise science. This is all happening at the same time found Naudi functional patterns online. And I started to realize that what Naudi was talking about seemed to be years beyond what they were teaching in kinesiology and the exercise science classes in college. And so that, that alone with just how my body was feeling based off of practicing what he talks about in the power of posture and the videos he was doing back in the day, I was like, okay, hey, he's onto something. I could feel the difference in my spine. I could feel my glutes just standing after doing pounds and pounds on a deadlift and trying to run and do different things to figure out how I was sprinting on my own, trying to dissect that without having that, that framework to work from. Yeah. I, I like, could hey, never th- feel my glutes. Like <laughs> I don't think, chance. I don't think ever. It was all lower back deadlifting for me. Yes. All. But not even with, with anything. And then yeah. feeling them standing, it's like, shh, holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've never felt them at all. I, as, yeah, it was yeah. always it was always back or quads. My I felt I right. Felt quads, like quads would always pump, absolutely. And my calves, my calves actually get because it's very difficult for you to feel your glutes in a relevant way, specifically sprinting, etc. Because now the, the main reason why Johnny is saying, okay, I was learning this stuff in exercise science. Uh, Rodney was saying he had an exercise science degree, right? Correct. So you're right, we have people with degrees. I was working at a high level box gym. I didn't have a formal background or a degree, et cetera, because we get a lot of kind of the credentialists that comment on our posts and stuff like that, that have high level degrees. And we essentially are like, well, it doesn't really matter because you're not taking the framework of gait being the optimal way to train your body. And is there an optimal biomechanics? It's like, well, why would be why would there be these advanced degrees if there wasn't an optimal biomechanics, right? And if there is an optimal biomechanics, then we have to have a foundational principle of a reference point in reality of what that is. So now he was really in functional patterns was really the first company to say, okay, we have a non-compromising view on gate being the blueprint or the reference point. But how how he got there, right? Because it's not, uh, from what I understand, Naughty didn't say, oh, gate is going to be the thing that I'm going to go with and impose his values. That's right. Through the, like back in the day, like with the power of posture, he just just had a hunch, okay, there needs to be a a certain alignment that's going to relate to better human health. And then you start getting all these muscle contractions from just standing. And it's like, okay, where does that lead to? And then little by little, then it, it, it came up to, okay, there is such a thing as optimal biomechanics and it seems to revolve about around gait. And then the big four. I think that's really good because he, he had a hunch about the anthropology and the framework, and then he tested it it's from the tough. bottom up. Okay, can yeah. I feel my glutes when I'm standing? Can I feel my glutes when I'm walking? Do I feel my core when I'm walking? Do I feel my right power of posture is core, glutes, T-spine, And right? what happens when those things are online like that? Exactly. And, and what's, how does that relate to someone like you, Mike, that right. came from deadlifting and all these things? How does it relate to someone right. like Johnny that has a spinal fusion? How does it right. relate to someone that has, you know, some uh, Parkinson's or cerebral palsy or exactly. something like that? So it's, it's tested and it's a, it's a, it's, it's practical. It does, it does uh, apply to multiple, um, what would you say? Populations, types the, of people, different right? Different yeah. types of people with different problems of varying ages and varying circumstances. And the common denominator is that one, we're all humans. We all stand on two feet. And then when we walk, we contralateral, we, uh, contralaterally yeah, reciprocate. reciprocate. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So why are we saying that gait is the most fundamental movement that you need to focus on with your training? That comes down to 
the said principle and the hierarchy of prioritization. So in life, right, there are things that you have to prioritize, right? And, and, and this is good because functional patterns didn't decide to this. Nature decided this. Physics decided this. This is going back to what we were saying, how Naudi first figured this out. It's about observing what's happening in reality, right? So when we're observing, observing what's happening in reality and we see humans walking, we see the best athletes moving and running and sprinting, what we're saying is, is that there's a hierarchy and prioritization when it comes to training. And if we're going to respect the said principle, then we have to say, okay, gait should be the centerpiece of our training. Now, or really improving gait mechanics should be the centerpiece of our training. If you want to have optimal health from your training, then your training must represent the circumstances that you come across in reality as closely as possible. Yeah, when we say uh, set principle is uh, specific adaptations to impose demands, meaning when we're saying we're gonna train the gait cycle we're not, or how to uh, optimize your gait cycle, we're not saying just run. So what goes into that is how your lat contracts with your obliques, for example, or the relationship between your pecs with your adductor and creating a specific contraction in that same context that relates to gait, that's what's gonna give a person like that optimal health or those benefits that we, that we mentioned earlier. And what we do, just real quick, without kind of giving away what we're doing is just what you see on Instagram is not the corrective work. It's not how we fatigue and create those contractions. That is what we've coined so far. And it might change, but overall, a way to explain it, how I explain it to my context, we call them IMAPs, Integrative Muscle Action Potentiation. We want to put people in a position that gives us an integrated muscle action. In other words, we want all the muscles that we want to fire to fire at the same time in the correct sequencing. That's what we're looking for when we do our corrective work. And like Mike said, we're not showing that on Instagram and YouTube. So for those of you that are watching and learning FP from the different social media accounts is there's more going on when you actually train with an FP trainer and attend one of our courses than what's being put forth on Instagram. So the, the fancy movements, the, I won't say fancy because what we do is not really fancy movements. They're intentional movements that we do. That's right. There's a s underlying sequencing of gait within exactly. those exercises that yes. allow those movements to happen. And that's what we're training ourselves and that's what we're training our clients to do. And you really figure that out once you actually train with a trainer or do one of the courses. I was gonna say, Rod, maybe you can pick up on this is, so we, we say you need to focus on walking, running and throwing, right? People will say, oh, well, you gotta squat. I stand, you stand every day. You stand as much as you walk, which if we wanna argue that point, you probably walk more than you do the act of standing up right, with your body. Right. You stand to then walk. Yes. So maybe talk a bit about that. It's like why walking is a priority, why we should train it, because it's literally what we do the most. Yeah, I was gonna say in terms of the Instagram things that people see, it's almost the result of us applying there you go. the the training to uh -huh. improve gait and then the the movements relate to gait. So then we're showcasing that certain aspects of that are, are improving. Uh, but it's not even what, like five percent it's 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 not it's, it doesn't I represent mean the vast that majority of my sessions is slow moving precise corrective work right and it's, and it's very individualized to wherever the person may be at and, and and what they're trying to work on first of all a lot of at high level athletes are not doing a lot of squatting and deadlifting anymore or traditional type training they're including a lot more rotation and contralateral oscillations and contralateral reciprocation in their training. And a lot of that I would like to think is because of FP's influence and FP's influence on the industry as a whole. Um, so that's number one. Number two, um, we have to remember that these people are succeeding because they have a certain level of resiliency that your, that your typical person, that your average Joe doesn't have, which is why when we were talking about Johnny made a video the other day saying if deadlifting worked the way that we would expect it to work then everybody would be able to move like a LeBron James or run like a Usain Bolt and people were saying oh well how does that make sense blah 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 well this is what we mean is that if their training worked it would work for everyone the problem is that we don't have a definition of what 
working even is. So then when people become in pain, they're stuck in all these abstractions. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be feeling or what optimal is. That's why there must be an optimal way to train. There is an optimal way. It is not just what worked for this person or that person or what worked for me or what worked for Johnny. It's about what works for humans as a biological organism. This is why there are people who are more successful in business than others. This is why there are people who are more successful in terms, in, in terms of how they live their life and how, in relationships than others, right? There's a nuts and bolts to relationships. There's a nuts and bolts to finance. There's a nuts and bolts to your health. And we have to get over the whole, well, this is just what works for me. And there can't be one way to do it, which we already went into. FP actually provides you the most variability in movement. If we want our training to most closely represent what we encounter in reality, then the deadlift isn't accounting for the rotations when we walk and when we run the uh, contralateral reciprocation oscillation of our legs, that nature, right? There's no unilateral dominance, although there is because everybody has a certain unilateral uh, dominance because of uh, imbalances in their body. It should be 50-50, but it would rarely ever be actually 50-50 weight distribution. Um, and because of that, because it's not accounting for those things, it's actually conditioning out your anterior oblique sling and posterior oblique sling. Because it's not respecting those things, you are getting the said principle with deadlifting. You are specifically ad adapting to not working with transverse rotation, to not working with uh, contralateral reciprocation. And because of that, you are conditioning out those qualities out of your movement, which basically you're making yourself worse. That's the truth of it. Yeah, I think when you think about the contraction that you would get from, uh, like, I know people do, uh, like, the glute bridges, but even with the deadlift, the contraction that you get from the glutes from standing on two feet, it's much different than the contraction you get um, when one leg is, is behind the other. Right. And then especially when the opposite lat is working or, or the obliques or et cetera. So right. the, you can feel that, like, once you do functional patterns, you can feel the difference of what the muscle feels like when you're using it properly, like respecting uh, the set principle, it respects the gait, versus what you're doing when you're doing something like a deadlift. Another thing too, when you're on the upper part of the deadlift, you have a lot of weight and then your spine ends up, uh, your lumbar ends up shearing forward. So you're putting a lot of compression there too, which it's probably a lack of the, the glute table to engage in a, in a position, uh, in that position when they're when they're oscillating. Uh, I don't know if I missed any any other. That's, that's right on. And let's make that clear that our problem is specifically with the barbell deadlift. The positioning that you're in with your spine when you grab the barbell and where you end up at the top, like Rodney was saying, your lumbar ends up shifting forward. And that's because the bar is traveling vertically as you're doing a horizontal hip extension. So you got a vertical force with the bar and you're doing a horizontal force with your hips. We can maybe put a diagram on the screen here to show how that's, there's a mismatch between the muscle connection you're getting and the positioning of your bones. And that positioning of the bones with the excessive vertical load is what causes the lumbar shearing and spinal compression and the lack of posterior chain recruitment, despite how much people want to tout the deadlift as being the ultimate posterior chain exercise. And that's why they're calling it the king of exercises. And we're saying, no, it's not the king of exercises gate would technically be the king. And the reason why is because of everything that we mentioned previously. So as opposed to, so because when they say king, what they're saying is that deadlift should be a centerpiece in your training. The squat should be the centerpiece of your training. And we're saying no, gait optimization should be the centerpiece of most people's trainings. For training for humans, gait optimization is it. Yeah, if you're getting good at the deadlift, sorry, if you're training the deadlift, you're getting good at the deadlift. Yes. But you're not getting good, better at the gate. You're not getting better at anything else. And real quick, that's why when we hear the refutations that say, well, I'm not, I don't want to train to run. I want to train to get better at deadlifting. Okay, that's fine. But you are essentially admitting 
that you are only doing it to get better at the deadlift, which is the whole problem. So therefore, should trainers be have, having their clients deadlifting? Because their rationale is that they're, when they're deadlifting, it's going to help their posture. It's going to help them move better. It's going to increase their relevant strength. And what we're saying is it's not going to do any of those things. It is only going to make you better at deadlifting and that's the said principle. So you can do it if you want to do it, but you have to be intellectually honest about what it's doing for you. So deadlifting makes you better at deadlifting, improving your gait cycle, makes you better at everything. everything that you do with your body exactly. movement wise. It's yeah. the derivative of movement. And let's also state that we lift at FP. That's right. We practice lifting. There's yes. a mechanical advantage to being able to pick an object up off the ground. And we'll get into some of those examples here and talking about the difference between a barbell deadlift and other lifts such as a stone lift or even just different movements that you can do from a unilateral, bilateral position. We're right. not saying not to lift. We're saying that you don't need to do barbell deadlifts for minimal posterior chain recruitment and maximal spinal compression with very little transfer or carryover into other aspects of how you move your body. It, it, like you're saying, the said principle, it's the deadlift, barbell deadlifts will make you good at barbell deadlifts. There's very little transfer elsewhere. And, be, and so that's what we're saying. He's saying there's very little transfer. So we're not saying that there is zero, absolutely no benefit to doing a barbell deadlift, even though there is very little based on our definition. What we're saying is that the progressive overload and what you get out of the deadlift eventually will be superseded by the negative externalities of the lumbar shearing on your spine, conditioning out the AOS and POS, the fact that it doesn't account for the specific circumstances that you come across when you're moving your body in relation to gait. So we're not saying that there is zero, absolute no benefit from a barbell deadlift. We're saying in terms of spectrums, how much benefit are you getting in terms, in relation to how much risk there is doing it? Yeah, and there's some people that, that do, like, you know, they want to get the mass from the deadlifts because they think it's going to translate. But according to the set principle, it's not. It's, it's not. It, it becomes useless, useless mass. And then uh, it doesn't scale. You already said this, but it doesn't scale to the average person. Um, so yeah, there's just no Well, and that muscle mass is causing compression because the muscle is orienting around compression. It's orienting around a bilateral sagittal plane orientation, which is not what happens when you walk and run, which is why for the most part, the people who can deadlift, who actually get up to these five, six, seven, eight hundred pound ranges, they typically don't sprint, right? They typically don't sprint well. Otherwise, it would be like Johnny's talking about, they would, all, they would be the ones winning the 100 meter, the 200 meter, right? If they were, the best if that was trans, would be the, best the best deadlifters would be the best sprinters. Because they would have the most strength in their posterior chain, which Correct. means it's going to translate to them exerting more power when they run. Exactly. When we talk about deadlifts not strengthening you as it relates to the movements that you do in reality, we're talking again about the correlation between the motion of a deadlift, improving the function of how you walk, run, and sprint. We're using the word as sp to sprint as the main benchmark, but even just how you walk. And we'll get into here a little bit about the contralateral reciprocation of the spine, arms, and legs, and how that function of local motion is basically absent at the highest levels of training. It's becoming more apparent because of functional patterns and what Naudi's done to push it into the industry thus far and what we're continuing to do. But just, just the framework of training, is, we're thinking that bilateral lifts are going to make you better at unilateral movement. And that's where there's a clear distinction there that's not being assessed and that's not being considered in the studies either. Is we're just hoping that the bilateral lifts transfer to the unilateral movement instead of trying to improve the unilateral movement in, in, its, uh, in its own. Yeah, and it's not what we see at all. Like the bilateral lifts, because of the reasons that we just pointed out and you know the set principle, everything that we just said is just, there's no, can't argue that. And the sample sizes just aren't large enough as well. I mean, if you're gonna really be evidence-based, it's hard to do that with the fitness industry. I mean, you, anybody is welcome to send in whatever they think. I guarantee you that one of those confounding variables will pop up 
we did the whole, we did a video in why the squat is the most overrated exercise in the history of fitness. And we had talked about it. And when, when people were talking about squat being the king of exercises, we did a video on that too. So we've done two videos on the squat and, uh, and we talk about confounding variables and studies. So if you're going to be quote unquote evidence-based and kind of be this kind of virtue signaling type, then go ahead and send them in and we're going to talk about the confounding variables as well. And to go into that, let's talk about why the deadlift isn't the king of all exercise. Let's use this video here. So this is uh, from a page called Mind Pump. And this is one of the Instagram videos we, we broke down on the functional patterns Instagram. Let's go ahead and play this back here. The squat has been touted as the king of all exercises for a long time, but I, I would like to argue that the deadlift is. You get as much of a full body activation. You get just as big a bang for your buck when it comes to CNS and overall total body. On top of that, what we understand as trainers, one of the biggest things you're trying to combat is posture issues with people, like the rounding of their shoulders, the forward head, the, the closing of their body, and the, and the weakening of all the muscles in the posterior chain. Yes. So that's what that's caused from, right? You get really weak muscles in the posterior chain, you get this over usage, tightening and shortening of the muscles in the anterior, so in the front of the body, and we're rounding for So let's, yeah, let's pause that there. So what's the problem with only accounting for bilateral lift strength and thinking that it's that posterior chain strength is gonna transfer into how you move? What's the problem with what he's saying there? Uh, first of, oh. just, uh, sorry, Go sorry. Ahead. I didn't mean to just jump in, but just first of all, I wanna say that this is part of the fitness novelty machine. This is very characteristic of the fitness novelty machine. What's the king of exercises? Is it the squat or is it the deadlift? And if it's not the deadlift, it's the squat. And yeah, if let's, it's not the squat, it's the deadlift. It's the deadlift. Yeah. Like how many times over the course of decades are we going to bounce back and forth between the squat or the deadlift as the king of all exercises? Like how long is this debate going to run? So we've talked about this, just like what's the best mobility training? What's the best way to build strength? What's the best way to fix your knees, et cetera, et cetera. That's five exercises. Exactly, it's just, exactly. It's a linear solution to a nonlinear problem, which is what the fitness novelty machine sells. Now deadlifting is back as the king of exercises. Eventually people will say that the lower back injury rate for deadlifting is too high and that instead the squat is the king of all exercises, right? We're recycling, repackaging, very characteristic of the fitness novelty machine. Yeah, I was going to say the first thing that kind of stood out there was how he's saying that the deadlift is the best exercise for your posterior chain when they're not, it doesn't seem like they're accounting for like above the waist in terms of like posterior chain. So right. he's talking about posture, which is good. He's talking about people aging and, and ending up like very kyphotic, which is right. good. But then the solution doesn't really match. Again, when you talk about like the set principle, it's like you don't see people that deadlift with good posture you don't see you don't see like if no, you don't. like if you're gonna have good posture you're probably gonna have to rotate well you're yes. probably gonna have to actually engage the rest of the posterior chain not just like uh hips and below which is what right. the kind of where the the deadlift stops right so yeah i was just funny that he's he's saying that it's the best exercise for your posterior chain assuming like okay everyone's on on board with this right. but it's like even before we get into like why the deadlift is not going to relate to gait. It's like even just that part where he's saying that it's the best exercise for the posterior chain. Even if you were just talking about right. standing, right. Not, even, not even there. Right. It's not relevant to standing. And with what Mike was saying about the fitness novelty machine, it's uh, people are fixated on sagittal plane lifts and thinking that's all there is for the posterior chain. When we're saying that once you add rotation and spinal flexion and extension with rotation into the mix, that puts a whole different stimulus on the posterior chain. So if he's talking about total body recruitment and load on the nervous system, right? That's another big thing that they'll use to justify an exercise. How taxing is the exercise? Right. For anyone that's done functional patterns, you probably have quickly realized how taxing engaging nearly every muscle on your body is through a motion versus something you may have done in the past with just a A to B lift. So with, as we get into why sprinting is the king of all exercise, it basically counters everything you just said there. Posterior chain recruitment is more prevalent with sprinting. The load on the nervous system is clearly more prevalent with sprinting. And 
the posture element. If you're going to correct posture, you need to introduce rotation of the spine and flexion and extension of the spine. And that goes deep. The mechanics of that goes deep and that's what we do at Functional Patterns. And the spectrums of flexion and extension are much more complex than I'm bending over to pick up a barbell and then I'm standing up with it. So even if you're going to say just from a, because they posted the like backline image, right? So even if you're going to say in relationship to frontline backline, okay, I'm contracting the backline and it's as simple as that. It's not as simple as that. And we were talking, uh, Johnny's uh, original a kind of uh, explanation about why you actually lose posterior chain, chain recruitment as you ascend on the deadlift, and that's why you end up just getting shearing forces on the lumbar. So when, if anything, you're making your postural problems worse, and that's why, and actually I wanted to just piggyback off of Johnny talking about being overzealous about the sagittal plane, over prioritizing hierarchy of prioritization, circling back to that. When you over prioritize sagittal plane movements, you are not accounting for the dysfunctional imbalances in your body. And that's because when you're working in the sagittal plane and you're trying to opt for that bilateral uh, stance, you're, if everybody has a, a certain amount of scoliosis, hip shift, rib cage shift, rib cage rotation, hip rotation, then that sagittal plane uh, exercise is not going to account for any of that, which is another thing that studies can't account for because your typical biomechanic people don't account for that. The people with kinesiology degrees and exercise science degrees don't account for those things when they run these studies. And so first you have to acknowledge that there's, dis there's dysfunction. Right. So what, how can we explain to people that well, they take, it, they take it to a certain point. I think when they, when they uh, say like, okay, you have to even squat and deadlift with good form, right. but it's, it's a very elementary, uh, I guess, it's only a certain amount of variables that they're able to account for, right? Like, exactly. okay, your feet have to be a certain way, right. uh, bend your knees, whatever the cues are. Keep your back straight. Keep your back straight, whatever, brace your core. But there's more, there's more to that than just, uh, like there's more to good form than what is uh, usually, how it's usually done in the fitness industry. Right. And again, it's relating to our uh, AOS, POS, uh, which relates to, to running. Right. Uh, the way your spine bends, the way your, uh, your asymmetries are versus like where your hips are versus where your, your rib cage is at. Right. So, like a lot of those aspects have to go into form. And again, one, you can account it when you're in a bilateral because you're, you're essentially you're, uh, this is something that, that uh, when clients come in and I take pictures of them, they've never taken a picture of themselves right. kind of standing neutral. They have no reference. And they're, they're like, oh, I kind of know I lean a little bit to, this, uh, to the left right. or whatever. And then they look at the picture and they're like, geez, like you can really tell when, when, when you just kind of see that. So if people are deadlifting like that, people are squatting like that, they're already like you can't have good form when you're structure is already stuck a certain way. That's right. And the only way to get out of that is by trying to optimize the gate because the, the gate is gonna pull you into one direction and then it's gonna pull you into the other direction. And when you have good form going one way and good form going the other way, it's gonna be more That's symmetric. It's gonna prompt, it's gonna prompt the, the symmetry. It's gonna prompt the right muscles to contract, That's right. the right muscles to go uh, into hypertrophy, uh, the right muscles to uh, stretch, right. mobilize yep. within the structure of yes. the gate. And you can't do that with a, with a deadlift. Totally. It's impossible. And just real quick, if with what they're saying that deadlifting made people's posture better, then even like, for example, Johnny's video was if deadlifting worked the way that it should, then everyone would be running like Usain Bolt. Even outside of that, on a much, even in a regressed circumstance, if it made posture better, then where are your scoliosis results, right? Where's the person that had an insane rib cage to the left and a big hip shift to the right, and then they deadlifted and then now that's better, right? Like, cause they're just thinking, okay, Old people are bent over, therefore you should deadlift and there and they will be standing up straight. Yeah. It's like, guys, yeah, come good, on. Good posture is stand up straight, pull your shoulders back. Exactly. So when you deadlift and you have 400 pounds on yes. you, pull your shoulders back and lift right. your chest and up. That, and that therefore and that, will help your posture. Therefore it's good for your posture. Yeah. Right. So they're essentially playing with little building blocks, right? We're, exactly. We're talking about what constitutes the structure of a building. The human body right. as a structure is pretty complex. And exactly. So, so to narrow it down to just only sagittal plane exercise, that's where you're literally 
keeping yourself against the wall, you're butting the, your head against the wall as you just only focus on sagittal plane training. We're saying that there's more, and when you focus on what's outside of the sagittal plane, you're gonna actually improve your sagittal plane lifts, but you're gonna get better at the 90% that people aren't focusing on, which is training in relation to your gait cycle. Yeah, another obvious one is obviously you're on your, you're in two feet, so the weight distribution is gonna be uh, kind of 50-50. When you run, you're gonna be 100% on one, 100% on the other. So there's no way to train how your, how your system reacts to that, while you're, the forces while you're running, when you're stuck with your feet side by side with the, with the load. Yeah. Then we can go point by point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> well, first off, just the general, if we're gonna analyze how that comment's written, right. it's kind of in line with the mindset that would say deadlifts are the king of all exercise, right? right. It's a little bit basic. Yeah. And so, it, Rodney, you're gonna go on the top there? Yeah, I mean, uh, like saying either or, we, are, we kind of are saying either or, in terms of the talking about the deadlift right the but, barbell deadlift. yes but in, when it comes to different movement variations that uh come from focusing on your gait then we're not like we're we're saying wrestling is good yeah uh, some sports like basketball the movements that you go into that those are good lifting when you're not using a barbell that could be good right. so we're not saying either or e like people conflate FP as like, yes. okay, it's, it's uh, these exercises or like this thing, yes. but that's not what we're, what we're saying at all. We're saying focus on the big four, yes. how to stand, walk, run, throw. Yeah. And then from there, you actually get a lot more diversified. So you don't end up being either or. There's actually a lot that you can do mm -hmm. and, that, and you can actually do it, do it, do it better, do it well. They're, they're saying it's a, it's a dogma rather than a system. And uh, as far as where he was talking about the average person, right? Right. That they have good intentions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So having good, which is ironic. Expand on that, Mike, and how, what's actually having good intentions for the average person? I'm going to do two quick points here, if you guys are good with that. One, he's saying it's typical. It is atypical. What we're saying is completely atypical from what people normally say. So number one, point one, wrong. It is not typical. And the reason I say that is not just because what we're saying is unique, but also because the vast majority, a typical thing for the fitness novelty machine to say would be to say, do yoga, do deadlifting, do stretching, do what works for you, do what you feel in your heart, euphemism, 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 euphemism. This is what I'm talking about, guys. If you are attracted to those euphemistic things, then that is a problem inherently in and of itself. The most successful people in the world know that the world does not actually work that way, right? You can't say yes to everything. What we're saying is not typical. It is atypical. So that's number one. Number two, when it comes to, can you pull me right back on track, Johnny? Yeah, so just thing? The, that them promoting deadlifts as an exercise that's good for the average person. Yes, exactly. There's irony there because what we're saying is that deadlifting is not even good for an athlete, but athletes on the highest end of the spectrum will survive it, but that it's not actually good for them, but that your average person is getting killed by doing deadlifting. You are making people worse, you're making your average Joe worse by deadlifting. The trainers and the coaches, they, and they barely survive it. The coaches are injured all the time, right? They always have lower back problems, groin problems, knee problems. When they're doing powerlifting, what do they have? elbow wraps, knee wraps, right? They have the, the belts on, all that stuff, all these accessories just to be able to deadlift heavy weight. So it, why would you need all of that if this is just good for your average person, right? So that's the irony in it. If, if it was good for the average person, then everybody would be able to move well, sprint well, be injury free, lift their anything that they needed to lift and go through the circumstances of their daily life. But that's not what's happening when you have people deadlift over and over again. That's I think we're starting to see too that even the biomechanical trust fund babies are seeing the repercussions, the negative repercussions of prioritizing bilateral lifts to where their bodies are even not holding up to it to the same degree. There's probably some other factors that could be introduced there. We talk about environment, nutrition and just things that they're doing that are taking away from the genetic gifts that they have that then make the bilateral lifts fail for them as well. So, and as far as maladaptation, I've seen that 
prevalent with people I know personally, athletes I know personally that are getting hurt from the bilateral lifts, no matter how much of a freak they are genetically. And uh, even, even uh, people that are more in the public space, there's a man named Half Thor Bjornsson, who has the world record deadlift. Hasn't quite injured his back doing deadlifts yet, but he recently tore his pec doing a bench press PR it, for his group there in his gym. And we, without getting into the, the social pressure that created that environment for him to tear his pec, it's like you take a genetic freak like that and out of pure ego, he's not, he's not an offensive lineman, he's not a defensive lineman, he's just trying to be the strongest person in the world, which that goal is a whole other thing in and of itself. Let's say he has the genetic capabilities to be the strongest man in the world, which he's been he still tore his pec on an exercise that was centered around validation and, and lost a lot of the genetic frame that he has with that. I'm not saying he can't recover from the injury, he obviously probably will, but just that mindset of, we can't keep saying that, oh, if you didn't hit the genetic lottery, sorry, there's no hope for you. With functional patterns, we're trying to take what puts people in the genetic freak category and download that information as in, in the form of exercise to everyone. Yep, and you see that when uh, you see the Parkinson's uh, results, when you see the cerebral palsy results, you see that it's like pe these people that have so much of a deficit in that realm start to be able to move and live like, a, like an average person, which for them, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a huge deal. Like it wasn't possible before. Right. So. So with that being said, I thank you know, Johnny for coming in and Rodney to have this conversation. And that pretty much sums up why gait should be the centerpiece of your training. So this is Michael Musiolo with Functional Patterns Santa Monica signing off, reminding you to think intentionally and not habitually.